Greetings. This is the uh, lecture for BSF lesson number 26 concerning the second part of Jeremiah. Will you join me in prayer? <clears throat> oh, all-powerful and sovereign Lord, nothing is too hard for you. And yet, uh, as we open up uh, Jeremiah this week and look at the dire straits that the people of Judah were in, we see that um, the, their only hope is in you. And that's true for us as well, Heavenly Father. Um, our sinful state is one that we cannot affect, and yet um, you can. And so, Lord, we, we pray as we study about this situation there and your plan for your new covenant, uh, we ask, Lord, that you would help us to truly see our helpless estate and that we, might, um, that we might come to your son, Jesus Christ, uh, the only true source of hope and salvation. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, there are a few things that we can all agree upon, I think, today. But as we look at the world around us, the sense of brokenness that we see seems to be one. It's easy to see that something's just not right in our world. Even the most ardent atheists, materialists, progressives, conservatives, environmentalists, uh, people of religious persuasion, all would likely agree, acknowledge that we live in a world replete with serious problems. We have wars and insurrections. We have various ecological challenges facing us. We, our financial markets, our on the verge of serious decline. In our personal relationships, we demonize those who disagree with our positions. Even within our families, our loved ones, we have broken relationships. We all feel a sense of brokenness in this world. Even when we try to do right, things often backfire. As evident as this truth may be, no one seems interested in facing it. That the why and the what we do about it is never discussed. And that's because no one has an answer for it. Sin is the problem. And we don't want to face our sins. Sin has broken our world. And because we have rejected God and his word, we cannot face our current reality. I said no one has an answer for it, but the Bible does. We Christians know that sin is not the end of the story. And this week, as we complete our study of the book of Jeremiah, I, th I think we're going to see how God speaks to the reality. Uh, the reality of this brokenness, the damage that sin has caused, and the reality that hope still remains. As we complete our two-week survey of Jeremiah's ministry, we'll see what is truly broken is our, uh, our covenantal relationship with God. Jeremiah will recount how Israel and Judah broke uh, the covenant with the Lord. Two weeks ago, we looked at God's call to Jeremiah. We looked at his mission and God's promises uh, and how that all played out in his life. This week, we were going to look closer at his message. And to be fair, much of the minor prophets' messages have appeared to be the same. We've seen that throughout the year. The people, the prophets called the people to repent of their sins and return to the Lord. If not, God was going to bring judgment. And yet, even within their message of judgment, there was this far off future restoration at which they hinted. Jeremiah's message is similar, but Jeremiah's going to go farther. He's going to provide key details that bring clarity to God's solution, God's redemptive plan. And to help us organize this talk, I want to remind you of God's call to Jeremiah in chapter 1. Uh, Jeremiah had that vision of God reaching out and touching him on the lips. And he says, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. This summarizes Jeremiah's ministry and message. This, 
verse is our roadmap to discuss this large body of Jeremiah's work. So my outline is made up of two divisions. First, we're going to see Jeremiah's message of God's judgment. That's covering chapters 2 through 29. And here is the uproot and tear down part of his ministry. People today think that they are good. They're basically good. Uh, but we're going to see that's not the case and that Jeremiah is going to uproot and tear down that very idea. And then we're going to see Jeremiah's message of God's future restoration, chapters 30 through 52. This is the constructive part, the build up and the plant as he introduces God's new covenant to us. Now, chapters 2 to 29 contain a series of Jeremiah's sermons to the people. I didn't count them, but our lesson tells us that there were 14 separate messages. And in this section, Jeremiah is consistent with the past prophets that we've studied, both in approach and content. Like Micah before him, Jeremiah acted like a prosecuting attorney. He brought charges against the people. The people had repaid the Lord's goodness toward them with evil. He had chosen them from all the nations of the earth to be his bride, his special people. And, and, and how had they responded? By following worthless idols. The leaders did not follow his law. The priests did not teach his law. And the prophets did not prophesy his messages. And so in chapter 2, verse 9, uh, the Lord says, Therefore I will bring charges against you again. And I will bring charges against your children's children. Jeremiah challenged the people to look throughout the world. Were there any countries who had ever forsaken their national gods? No. Only Israel and Judah had exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. And if they had just confessed this sin, chapter 3, verse 13, Jeremiah implored the people, only acknowledge your guilt. You have rebelled against the Lord your God and scattered your favors to foreign gods. And so the first step to repentance is confession. And it is the hardest thing to do, acknowledging our guilt before God. In the first of several action sermons, God commanded Jeremiah to search out Jerusalem. If he found one righteous person, the Lord would spare Jerusalem. He went to the common folks, but he found no righteous there. He went to the leaders, he found none there. And Jeremiah concluded that the people had not been trained properly. Forsaking the Lord uh, often begins with bad leadership. And that was the case there in Israel and Judah. In chapter 5, verse 13, he says, The prophets are but wind, and the word is not in them. A horrible and shocking thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy lies, the priests rule by their own authority, and the people love it this way. Jeremiah concluded, or he, he said, Let what they say be done to them. Forsaking the Lord leads to a forsaking of his laws. Like Joel and Zephaniah, Jeremiah condemned the wickedness of Jerusalem. The people no longer feared the Lord. They set traps for people. They enslaved their own countrymen. Called to justice and mercy? Did they promote the case of the fatherless? Did they defend the cause of the poor? No. Three times each year, the people were to gather at the Jerusalem temple for religious holidays. Beginning in chapter 7, Jeremiah took the, stood at the city gates, and as the people streamed in to worship, uh, he, he um, warned them of uh, their distorted pr worship practices. Their lives did not match their observances. They, they presumed on the Lord's protection and the idea that he would never let the temple be destroyed. They had missed the point of God's past deliverance uh, from the Assyrians in Hezekiah's day. They had failed to heed Isaiah's prophecy concerning Babylon. 
trusting in outward conformity uh, would lead to judgment in Jerusalem. And that's still true today. Chapter 11, God's prophet informed the people they had broken covenant with the Lord. In full disclosure, God had informed the people of the terms of their agreement, and they had concurred. But repeatedly, they failed to keep their part of the deal, that is, obedience to his law. The Lord, for his part, sent disaster after disaster to dissuade them of their actions, but to no avail. Shockingly, in chapter 7, verse 16, the Lord forbade his prophet to even pray for the people. God said he would no longer listen. There is a time when praying will no longer do any good. Unlike Jeremiah, we don't know when that is, and so we better be praying for our lost loved ones and for the world while we still can. Israel's example is one that we will miss at our own peril. They show us that following God's law can never justify. It will only condemn. God presented the people with a clear choice. He said obedience and life on one hand versus disobedience and death on the other. And while they vo voiced their uh, approval to that idea and that they promised to obey, they always chose disobedience every time. And that's what we will choose too. We don't think so, but we will. Because Jeremiah says in seven, chapter 17, he says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? So Israel's futility in following the law is our futility. None of us can do it. As the years went by and Jeremiah observed no change for the good, I had to believe that he was tempted to harden his heart. But that doesn't seem to be the case. He felt anguish for the people and their situation. He grieved over the impact of sin in their daily lives. And as we watch our nation's downward spiral, it's easy for us to want justice for those opposed to God. But that's not our calling. Jeremiah was told not to pray for Judah, but he did. He identified with the people who ignored his messages. He acknowledged Judah's sins and he asked the Lord to intercede, not for their sake, but for the sake of his name. Jeremiah asked God to act so that he would not be dishonored. What a heart Jeremiah had for the Lord and for the nation. And that's the attitude that you and I should display, even as we see our nation rushing towards judgment. Now, alongside of his sermons, Jeremiah was progressively revealing details, specific details, about the coming judgment. Early on, they were general. Chapter 4, verse 6, Jeremiah forecast simply that disaster was coming from the north. But later, he would reveal more and more details. In chapter 25, Jeremiah unveils the details of God's coming judgment. He says, for 23 years, the Lord has come to me, and I have spoken to you again and again, but you have not listened. But then he went on to say, therefore, the Lord says this, because you have not listened to my words, I will summon all the peoples of the north and my servant Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all the surrounding nations. I will completely destroy them and make them an object of horror and scorn and an everlasting ruin. This whole country will become a desolate wasteland and these nations will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. All the while, the false prophets were proclaiming a different message. They cried, peace, peace. Jeremiah said, there would be no peace. They cried, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, thinking God would never abandon his dwelling place. But they, having abandoned the Lord and his word, still presumed on his loyalty towards them. But back to Jeremiah. He was not sugarcoating God's judgment in the least. And I think that's a lesson for us today. We should not downplay the grave nature of sin and its consequences. 
Jeremiah told the people that disaster loomed out of the north, terrible disaster. And he told the people their young men would die by the sword and by famine. No one would be saved. He said even the rich who are usually um, safe from disasters, they would not they would not be immune from this one. Babylon's domination of Judah extended some 20 years before they finally destroyed Jerusalem. Starting in 605 BC, Babylon forced King Je Jehoiakim to submit, and he was carried into exile and uh, imprisoned there. Uh, taken into exile with him was the first contingent of Israelites. There would be additional exiles, two of them, and, the, and Jerusalem was ultimately sacked and burned in 586 BC. As these events played themselves out, they validated Jeremiah's message and contradicted that of the false prophets. And yet repeatedly, the kings and the people dismissed Jeremiah's messages, messages that would have saved them. And so my principle here it is that sin corrupts all that is good. Why do we sin? I submit to you that it is because we love to sin. What I mean is, in the moment, we want to sin more than anything else. We want to sin more than we want to obey. We love to sin more than we love our Lord. Sin has so corrupted our natures that we do what is irrational. The kings and the people would approach Jeremiah uh, for a word from God. They would ask him to pray for them and provide guidance. And yet each time they rejected God's word, even accusing Jeremiah of trying to trick them. He was a traitor. Judah is an example of how pervasive sin is in our lives, how much it has corrupted us. The obstinance of the people of Judah is a reflection of the brokenness in this world. They were the people of the covenant and yet had broken God's law repeatedly. Their example shows us that we can't keep a conditional covenant because of sin. Yes, we are made in the image of God and yes, we are capable of doing some good, but in the end, we are sinners who, who will rebel against God. We are helpless in this condition, and the Old Covenant reveals that truth. And who can deny that fact as we look out over our modern, uh, modern world, how we are tearing ourselves apart, how we have flipped our standards, declaring what is wrong right and what is right wrong. I look at myself and I feel like my nature is like an onion. Each time I peel away another layer of sinful thoughts or motives, what do I find? Do I find something pure below that? No, I find another sinful layer and it will never end. How about you? I ask you, how or where have you experienced sin's corruption recently? To the extent that you and I can make godly and right decisions, we need to get down on our knees and thank God because it is only through his help that we can do so. Now, when things are the darkest for mankind, that is when the gospel shines the brightest. And it is here in Jeremiah's prophecies that the Lord starts to reveal his solution to our problem. Like Joel and Amos and Micah before, Jeremiah promises God's hope. So now we jump ahead to the latter half of Jeremiah's writings, chapters 30 to 52. And God's hope is presented in several ways. Despite their sin, despite the very real damage that sin has caused, God's people could still have hope. First, God's people um, could have hope because God was going to establish a new covenant. Jeremiah reveals that in chapters 30 to 33. In addition, God's people could still have hope because God's enemies would ultimately be defeated. And we'll see that in chapters 46 to 51. And then finally, God's people could still have hope because God's remnant would remain. 
And we'll see that at the end in chapter 52. To lay the foundation for God's covenant, though, I want to back up and review his past covenants. Starting all the way back in Genesis, God, you'll remember, initiated a covenant or a promise or a contract with the people. Chapter 12, it's what theologians call the Abrahamic covenant. And at that time, God said to Abraham and to his descendants, who would later become the, the people of Israel and Judah, God said, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and the people on earth will be blessed through you. This promise was unconditional. It did not rely on anything that Abraham would do. To, you know, or his, even his descendants would do. They would experience his blessing, the blessings of being in relationship with God and representing the Lord to the world. Now fast forward about six centuries to the books of Exodus and Deuteronomy. As part of that very same covenant relationship, um, that same partnership, God then revealed to his people how to best experience his blessing and how to best represent him to the world. And he said, if you obey my law, you will experience blessing. But if you disobey my law, you will experience discipline. This is the Mosaic covenant. When presented with this conditional covenant at Mount Sinai, all the people heartily agreed to obey its provisions. But then they turned right around and disobeyed, creating the golden calf. After further disobedience, God caused that generation to wander in the wilderness and ultimately die. Moses later renewed this covenant with the next generation before they entered the promised land. Still they disobeyed. And this pattern of Israel's disobedience continued all the way down to Jeremiah's day. By refusing to obey God's law and submit to his authority, in effect, the people opted out of the covenant. They forfeited God's blessings and showed that they did not want to be his holy people. So what was God to do? Would he totally walk away from Israel? No, no, because he is still faithful to his conditional covenant with Abraham. By grace, he had chosen these people, and it was by grace that he would restore them. God said, I will bless you not because of anything that they had done or would do, but because he had freely chosen them by grace. He said, I will bless you. Remember, it's God's grace, not his judgment, that has the last word for his people. God is faithful and true. He cannot go back on his word. So he could not reject his people forever. Instead, God in eternity past determined the only option. He would not reject his people. Instead, he would bring about a new covenant. And his people had broken the old Mosaic covenant, so now God was going to bring about a new and better one. And that's exactly what Jeremiah introduces in chapters 30 to 33. Chapter 31, verse 31. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt, because they broke that covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, no the Lord, because they will all know, know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. These verses are central to what we Christians believe. In a sense, these verses, uh, th th these are the dividing point where, where Christianity and Judaism part ways. 
God's promise in these verses is realized in the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. And God's promises in these verses will ultimately be fulfilled in his second coming. It is by faith alone in Christ who shed his blood for you and me on the cross. It is by faith in him that you and I enter into God's new covenant. The author of Hebrews says it is a new and better one. There is nothing wrong with God's law. It reveals his perfect standard. It shows what God values in our lives. But the problem is our sin. We can't keep the law, and so our actions will ultimately condemn us. In his new covenant, though, God still upholds his law. But now, he says, I will write my law on their hearts so that by nature, by, by a new nature, my people will long to obey my law and represent me well in the world. As the Holy Spirit transforms our hearts, we will love to obey more than we love to sin. It is God's doing in us. God's new covenant is eternalized and it's permanent. It is guaranteed by God. And how do we know this? Chapter 31, verse 35. Jeremiah says that the one who made this covenant is the same one who has appointed the sun to shine by day and who decreed the moon and the stars to shine by night. And he says, God says, only if these vanish from our sight will this covenant cease. In other words, if your faith or my faith ever wavers, all we have to do is wait until the dawn because every day that the sun rises is another day that we can be confident that Jesus Christ is our Savior. That's why Hebrews says he is the guarantor of this covenant. So you can see that our hope in this new covenant is not like the world's hope. It is certain. It is guaranteed. Now another source of hope is found in God's just dealings with the nations. Jumping forward to chapters 46 to 50, we see that Jeremiah addresses 10 nations. Egypt, Philistia, Moab, Ammon, Edom, Damascus, Kedar, and Hazor, Elam, and Babylon. Ba each of these nations at various times in history had sought to harm or destroy Israel. And you'll remember Genesis 12, as part of the Abrahamic covenant, God promised, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. So Jeremiah was encouraging the people. He said, God hasn't forgotten this part of the covenant. In his time and in his way, he would address these nations for what they had done to them. And yet, there's also grace embedded in his judgment of these nations. For several of the nations, Egypt, Moab, Ammon, and Elam, he states, yet I will restore their fortunes in days to come. You see, from God's perspective, nations rise and fall. They are judged in time and history. Nations don't ha have souls. So he uses them as instruments of judgment or blessing. John Hanna says that nations are the servants of God to bring about the progression of his purposes in world history. And he does it in almost incomprehensible ways. We may only understand later as we look back on history. No nation, no nation is godly. All have been given over to Satan, even though Satan ultimately serves God's purposes. God preserves nations until they have accomplished his purpose for them. When they have fulfilled their purposes, he withdraws his preserving mercies, allowing them to do as they would please to bring about, to bring upon them the justice of his wrath. But God provides grace to people within those nations. He cares about them and he wants to draw them to himself. Like God, we must distinguish between the nation and the peoples of the nation. And so the final element of hope we find is at the very end of Jeremiah's writings, at the very end of chapter 52. This seemingly trivial note regarding King Jehoiachin, 
37 years after he had been taken into exile and imprisoned. A new Babylonian king came up to power and he was released and given a place of honor. It's a, it's a glimmer of the promise of God to be fulfilled. And this note comes on the heels of Jeremiah's description of the horrible fall of Jerusalem, the slaughter of the people and the destruction of the city. Even in the darkest days, God provides hope. His grace is the final word because Jesus Christ is our hope. You and I can look forward to God's promised restoration. And so let me give you the principle here. And, and that is that only God can restore what sin has corrupted. It is easy to think that the world is going to hell in a handbasket. There's nothing in the media that will provide a thinking man with any form of real hope. But real hope is found only in the word of God. Jeremiah felt the same way that we do, but he was told by God, I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? And then think of the, this promise that Jeremiah was given. The Lord said, the days are coming when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. The Lord has both the power and the integrity of character to fulfill all of his promises. And this righteous branch that, that Jeremiah was, uh, was promised, he has already come among us and he is coming again. You know, I love the story where Jeremiah was commanded by God to purchase his uncle's land, even as they were bottled up in Jerusalem and besieged. What a demonstration of faith in God and his future promises. So I ask you, what tangible and seemingly foolish act can you point to in your life that reveals your faith in God's promises? How have you demonstrated your belief that nothing is too hard for our Lord? God's covenant promises don't just apply to eternity. They should affect our lives today in a way that people will see. And with that, let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so grateful that you have, through your infinite wisdom, uh, determined a way that we sinners can be reconciled to you, restored into a right relationship with you. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for this new covenant that depends not on us, but depends wholly on him. And we thank you for him being that great, our great high priest and guarantor of this covenant. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would work in and through us to be great presenters of this gospel message to those around us, the many who are in need of hearing this message. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.